Good evening, professional colleagues, friends of chartered accountants, captain of industries, students, ladies and gentlemen. We want to welcome you to another edition of ICANN on Air. This day, the 21st of June, 2022. And I want to believe that our previous edition has been very educative very insightful and it's been increasing our knowledge base and that is why we are always here to give you the top notch of the program on ICANN on air today today we will be talking on international taxation and the nigeria economy you and i understand that tax are mandatory contribution uh levied on individual and corporation by the government, whether at the local level, at the uh, regional level, and at the national level. But has taken a step further by making it on the international basis, uh, based on the globalization that we are experiencing in no distance time. And that's why we have put together issue that has to be on international taxation and the uh, Nigeria economy. And today, I will be guesting no other person than Mr. Onosami Emmanuel, uh, ACA. Who is he? Before I bring him on board, uh, currently he is a senior manager in the transfer pricing service decision uh, division of Adansin in Nigeria. Prior to him joining Adansin, he worked with Chi Nigeria as a regulatory officer for where he joined the tax and regulatory services division of the KPMG professional. He has balanced, he has a balanced uh, experience in corporate finance, tax and transfer uh, price and services across the industry sector. His passion for contribution value to businesses in Nigeria led him to see relevant skill required for effective contribution uh, and guidance. Uh, he is uh, a transfer pricing advisory services, which include planning, and policy development, tax and TP compliance services, and uh, the TP controversial services. Uh, he, he also have his experience on it. In his current employment, he provides tax and transfer pricing services to diverse industry. Uh, to him, he, he, for his educational career, uh, he, wore, he has his BSc in food engineering from the prestigious Obafemi Aulowo University. Uh, a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountant of Nigeria, an associate member, uh, a, a member of the Associate of the Certified Chartered Accountant, ACCA, uh, Chartered Institute of Management Accountant, CIMA, a National Examination Board on Occupational Safety and Health from United Kingdom. In no distance time, I will be unveiling our guest speaker for today. But before that, I'll go on a very short break. And when we'll be back, we'll be discussing with Mr. Emmanuel or Nosami, ACA. I'll be right back with you. Thank you. As a finance professional in a disrupted business landscape, what does it take to be in demand? What does it take to attract great paying international roles? If you're an ICANN member, it'll just take one exam. That's all it takes to complete the globally recognized SEMA professional qualification and the internationally in respected CGMA designation. As a SEMA member and a CGMA designation holder, employers will look at you as a finance professional, constantly acquiring new skills to add value to the business. That's why they'll be willing to pay premium to hire and retain you. If you have five years of relevant experience and are an ICANN member, you can directly sit for the final exam of the SEMA professional qualification, the strategic case study exam. Start studying the SEMA professional qualification. Prepare to make an impact. Welcome back. Welcome back. 
And it's my pleasure to bring to bear the guest speaker for today, a seasoned professional, Mr. Emmanuel Onosami, SCA. You're welcome. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Alisheshan, for having me this evening. Thank you. A pleasure to have you. So we eat the grand running this evening, talking about uh, international taxation and Nigeria economy. Firstly, I want to ask this question. We have the Nigerian tax system, and uh, yeah, we are talking about international tax taxation. What is international taxation, and how is it different from the Nigerian taxation? Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Ogu Session and uh, the ICANN body, my senior professionals and uh, my colleagues on this uh, on this session tonight, this evening. You know, it's such a privilege to be uh, sharing thoughts on this topic uh, this evening. So if I can quickly respond to that question, uh, we all are aware, you know, at least if you are a student of finance, you know that uh, taxation for the most part is a local issue, you know, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, you have different countries with their different uh, tax law and their two different tax regimes. So, you know, what typically obtains within, you know, uh, a, a country, for example, Nigeria, you know, the different type of taxes that operate within the system, you know, the different tax law that we have, those things are those uh, are the things that are aggregated to determine what we call the Nigerian tax system or what we call the Nigerian tax uh, regime, you know, but when you now start uh, talking about tax interaction between one or two countries, then you have started introducing the concept of international taxation. You know, when you start talking about the tax that we apply on cross-border transactions, when you are talking about tax that we apply when you carry out international trade, when you talk about the uh, digital economy, and the type of taxation economy, uh, mechanism that we apply in such instances, then you have started talking about uh, international taxation. So to put it straight, straight away, to define international taxation for the purpose of the audience, you know, is an aspect of taxation you know, that speaks to the tax interaction between one or more countries. So you know, to put it in a very simplistic uh, manner, you know, is an aspect of taxation that speaks to the tax interaction between one or more countries. Thank you Wonderful. very much. Uh, let me stop there. You know. Thank you very much. In fact, you've simplified it by letting us know that once it has to do with two or more nations crossing border or going digital, then you are no longer talking of the local aspect of it, then you are going international. Well, let me just bring this to you. We now have two aspects of it. Nigerian tax system, which we can call the local tax system, and we're talking about international taxation. How can we harmonize uh, this Nigerian tax system and the international system? Is there any handshake with them? Oh, okay. So, uh, you know, I, I would love to address that question from this perspective. You know, uh, anything international taxation, you know, uh, from a global perspective, is always driven at the United Nations level. You understand, and uh, United States on through United Nations through the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development that we call the OECD, and uh, most of the time, you know what the OECD tries to do when it comes to international tax is to issue framework. You understand that can be adopted globally. You know, by different company, uh, company uh, countries when it comes to international relations or international trade, as the case may be. You know, but let me paint a scenario for for the purpose of understanding. If I am in a room and uh, I'm with uh, Mr. Lucian, for example, and we are given the tax to design a framework that will benefit every of the audience in this room. You understand. We will, including ourselves, one of the things that we're always careful to do is that, yes, we are empathetic towards the people, but we are never going to ever come up with a framework that will harm us. You understand, myself and Mr. Olusheson. And, uh, you know, although the United Nations is comprises of uh, multiple nations and people have their voices, but it's evident that, you know, some voices are more stronger 
at the United Nations level than the other or other countries based on the way you are ranked. You know, we are familiar with the G8, you are familiar with the G20 and, and, and all that, speaking to the power. You know, so most of the times when those international frameworks or law are coming down, are coming out, you know, and are being sold to other jurisdictions to adapt, you know, for the purpose of their own uh, uh, local laws or adapting it within their own uh, domestic regime, you know, one of the things that you want to also check out for, you know, locally is to see that uh, as much as possible, you know, your own interest is also covered as much as possible, you know, and that's when you can now talking about harmonization. To be honest, everything that has been churned out from the global scene and the global perspective when it comes to international transition, they are, they, they, for the most part, they are for the benefit of everybody that are part of that, you know. But uh, specifically, you know that different countries, they also have their different fiscal, fiscal regime and fiscal policy to stimulate growth within the economy and to improve the inflow of, uh, you know, foreign direct investment, you know. And if you look at it very well, the harmonization will then come from this perspective of saying where you think that whatever is coming from the international scene closely align with your direction as a nation, you know, you can uh, adopt and implement those recommendations in your local jurisdiction. But where you think that they are counter, uh, counter uh, policy for you and they are going to limit or inhibit the growth that you uh, try to uh, achieve as a nation, then you want to exercise caution before you embrace those uh, recommendations coming from the international sense. The truth is that once you agree to be part of an international framework, the way it works in the international transition scene is that uh, the agreements at the international level supersede your local domestic laws. So you need to be careful, watch carefully, and be sure that there uh, are recommendations that will enable you to achieve the growth that you seek, even as an economy, you know. And let me, let me, let me stop there for now. Okay, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'll, I'll take it from the last word you said about having an agreement with uh, the international space. And th th this will now bring these questions to bear. Uh, how does the international taxation affect the Nigerian tax? And does a uh, Nigerian accountant, do we need any special knowledge or uh, special certification to practice this? Considering the fact from your last statement, that we need to actually have an understanding and agreement. Do we need special certification as accountant? Because we know the role we play in making sure that the government have their revenue to time. Okay, let, let me just respond. Uh, based on experience, I, I, I wouldn't say that you need a special certification, you know, to practice international taxation. You know, we have seen a number of international tax lawyers, you know, where they provide uh, expert advice on international tax matters, uh, cross border uh, issues. And we have also seen, you know, even from the basic curriculum of uh, CITN, which is the body that is responsible for harmonizing the profession, you know, of taxation in Nigeria, you know, they, they, they also have that uh, aspect covered in, in, in a sense. So I, I would rather say that it's more of a matter of interest. You know, as a professional, you can develop interest in that niche and upscale and upskill yourself in that uh, particular uh, aspect of taxation. There are enough resources out there, you know, that you can latch on, you know, to upskill your knowledge around the area of international taxation. But uh, not to belittle the importance of certification, just like every other person wants to advance in knowledge, you, you know, you go to university to get a PhD, MSc. You know, we also have advanced, you know, uh, courses that people can also take on international taxation that can open their broader perspective on how these things work on a global scale. And I'm also aware that uh, in Nigeria, we have the IFA, you know, the uh, International Fiscal Association, you know, those people that pride themselves as an association of international tax experts in Nigeria. You know, if you are also interested in part of the association, where resources can be shared, ideas can be shared, knowledge can be shared, why not you can be there? But uh, to say you require a specific certification, I, I don't think so. Thank you very much. At least that cleared the, uh, the cost that uh, as a 
professional accountant, we have that prerequisite to practice international taxation. All we need to do is to gather more experience, be inquisitive to ask questions, associate and research more and more and more on that. And this will lead me to this question. In international taxation, there's one thing that I've always been hearing. Uh, I was always hearing it, TP, TP, TP. Later, they said it's transfer <laughs> pricing. And I'm like, ah, transfer <laughs> pricing. Let, let, let me just ask uh, this question. What is, uh, in the context of uh, international taxation, uh, what is transfer pricing? And how does it affect the Nigerian tax revenue? Okay, Th thank you very much. I promised myself not to use too much technical jargons, you know, <laughs> this evening. Uh, so that we can you, follow you, you smoothly. You, 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 are, you are pushing me gradually to that end, but I will try not to. You know, uh, let, me, let me respond by saying, you know, transfer pricing fundamentally is more of a performance management issue. You know, I think if we can understand it from that perspective, it will help us to, to appreciate the subject of performance management. You know, when we did our performance management course training, you know, we spoke about, uh, we were taught about a uh, divisional performance management, you know, where you have a cost center, where you have a profit center, you know, where you have to uh, make or buy, those kind of decisions that uh, typically relate to performance management. You know, then that speaks to, the price that one division, when you are looking at it from a, a performance management perspective, one division of a company is selling to another division such, such that we are maximizing the global profit of that uh, of that uh, company uh, as a whole. So, but the the twist, the what introduced transaction into transfer pricing is the fact that the tax law in different jurisdiction they differ. You know, and then, you know, uh, tax. Tax manager of multinationals then see transfer pricing as a two effective tax rate, you know, or potentially optimizing the effective tax rate of a group, you know, by using transfer pricing. For example, to put context to it for understanding. So we are in Nigeria where the effective tax rate of uh, corporate, you know, business is typically 32% okay. if you account for education taxes, you know. And uh, you take, for example, you go to a Dubai, you know, where there is no corporate tax rate. And you, know, you have an entity in Dubai providing management service to an entity in Nigeria. You know, at the group-wide level, it makes sense for you to report more of the group's profit in Dubai rather than reporting the group's profit in Nigeria. You understand? So but, uh, through the use of transfer pricing, you know, some smart uh, CFOs can actually achieve some form of uh, tax efficiency using transfer pricing to you know, maximize the, the profitability of the group in a region where you know, effective tax rate is, is, is less. But what we have seen in recent times is to say, because transfer pricing is a two-legged uh, is a two-legged uh, uh, too, and it's like all of us, we are sharing a big pie, you know. Different countries are trying to ensure that their share of pie is not uh, eroded. And that's what we typically call our tax base. You know, it's not eroded when it comes to uh, transfer pricing matter. So the, 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 the truth is that the concept of transfer pricing try to achieve, uh, when we speak about transfer pricing and putting regulation around it, what we're trying to achieve is to say, notwithstanding whether you are related or unrelated, there is an expectation, there is a moral burden on you as a business to conduct your transaction as if you are not related with your uh, group entities uh, in, a, in any manner. And that term, we call it commercial terms. So you, uh, we expect you to transact at commercial terms such that you maximize your local profit and the local tax authority can get their fair share of profit. And if you follow, you know, the developments, you know, the Google standard, the Starbucks standard, you know, where, you know, uh, the, it, it's been reported in the US that, you know, uh, some even one-man businesses are paying more tax than, uh, than, than Google. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because uh, in one way or the other, they have been able to, you know, use the tool of transfer pricing to move substantial portion of the group's profits to a region where they, they 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 may pay zero or close to zero taxes, you know. 
Okay. Uh, well, well, let, let me let me bump in the uh, uh, apology to from from what you're saying. Uh, can, can we say that this transfer pricing is actually uh, affecting the Nigeria Indigenous Company? Just from the explanation you've given. You've given. Okay, I, I said something earlier. You know, the best way to look at it is uh, we have a big pie or a big pizza on the table. You know that every country is trying to take their share of the pizza. You understand? And uh, as much as possible, there's a possibility that if you are not careful, you know, and you are not smart enough as a as a nation or as a tax authority, you know, your share of the pizza may be moved to another country. You understand? If you are not careful through the tool of transfer pricing. So there is a possibility that Nigerian businesses are being affected. And when I say affected in this perspective, I'm saying it from the perspective of the tax administration and the profit that is being reported in Nigeria. On a group-wide level, it may make sense for the Nigerian entity to be reporting less profit because the tax rate in Nigeria is high. But from a tax administration perspective, is that the right profit that that entity ought have declared. You understand? If not for the tool of transfer pricing that may have been used by the group to shift the profit from Nigeria to another jurisdiction where the tax rate is more friendly for the group's uh, uh, benefit. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, to our listeners at home, uh, at this point, I just want to uh, encourage you. I'm sure you are feeling mr onosami this evening on this international taxation feel free to bump in your questions uh so that uh, mr onosami can do justice to them uh it's icon on air this tuesday the 21st day of june 2022 and we are talking on international taxation and nigeria economy guesting mr emmanuel onosami and he's been doing Justice, putting perspective to this on the things that we need to do as professional accountant, the knowledge we're supposed to have as professional accountant to make sure that we contribute our own quota in the area of revenue generation for the country. Mr. Emmanuel, let me come, come back to you. Uh, the tax system of a country on the score is uh, our fiscal policy and a major determinant of a country's ability to finance our budget. How does international taxation affect Nigeria revenue and by extension, the overall economy? Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, like you've rightly said in, in your question, you know, tax is a major fiscal policy too, you know, that is being used by any government to rake in revenue for the purpose of governance. And uh, if you look at it, uh, apart from the oil revenue, that uh, Nigeria as an economy as uh, largely dependent on over the years, you know, there is a new focus on taxation to increase our tax uh, earnings. You know, in the past, Nigeria used to be known as one of the least uh, country that has um, uh, the tax to GDP ratio. But, you know, from what has been happening in recent times, there's an increased focus to increase our tax to GDP ratio to rank among, you know, the, the, the average, you know, across, across the globe. You know, so speaking to that, if you look at uh, what I said earlier during this uh, program, you know, about the way international tax work is the tax interaction between uh, one or more countries. And uh, as much as possible, you know, every country is trying to maintain its own share of the pie such that they can rake in enough revenue for the purpose of governance. And the same thing applies in the case of Nigeria. You know, Nigeria also needs a lot of uh, infrastructural development and that uh, this infrastructural development will def definitely be backed by, by some form of funding. You know, and look at uh, the, the the COVID came on us and the uh, oil revenue dwindled, and that was what largely responsible for the renewed focus on uh, on taxation. So, if you are not careful as a nation and you are not paying attention to international taxation, you may be leaving your food for other countries to be eaten. You understand? You may be 
put you may be leaving your revenue for other countries to be getting you know i explained the concept of transfer pricing earlier and many other many other aspects of international trans, uh, uh, taxation the aspect of tax transparency you know tax avoidance tax evasion you know by people that have that obligation in nigeria but are not fulfilling it you know so some global instruments have been designed from an international perspective to say if you are able to plug in into this framework, you know, we are able to guarantee that, you know, your fair share of income that relates to your economy remains in your economy. And let me let me try to uh, speak to that for the purpose of our audience. It's to say, you know, there are several projects that has been initiated at the United Nations level. You know, we are all familiar with the base erosion and profit shifting projects, which is standing on three polar pillars, you know. And one of the first pillars is to say substance. You know, gone are those days where, you know, you have a letterbox company, shell companies just being incorporated in one tax haven or tax friendly zone to house all the profit of the group, you know, without any significant uh, economy. So one of the things that uh, the OECD is pushing through several framework and multilateral, multilateral instruments that they are pushing is to see to it that uh, before you can get a fair share of the profit of a group or a multinational entity, you know, there must be substance to what you are doing. You cannot just be a letter company and you know, be housing all the, all the profit of the group. So there is an increase and aggressive you know, push at the international scene level to increase substantial regime, regime that are substantiated. Also, there is also an, a push at the international scene to improve coherence. Coherence in the sense that, you know, you have different tax law in different countries and, you know, uh, international tax experts have, have, have been able to, through the arbitrage that, that exists within different tax law, you know, design frameworks such that people enjoy do double non-taxation on a transaction. You are, you are exempted from a, the tax in one country and when you bring the income into another country, the income is still also exempted and those kind of frameworks. So the the OECD through uh, the OECD is also pushing you no know, inclusive framework where all uh, countries are encouraged to participate to kind of uh, fine tune all these kind of arrangements such that such kind of transaction will never escape you know paying the right share of taxes where those taxes are all, uh, are expected to be paid and the last aspect of uh, that BEPS uh, project is uh, transparency. You know, before now, you know, if, if you are a tax authority in a local jurisdiction, say Nigeria, and you are asking taxpayer about the affairs of their counterparts, in maybe in the U.S., you know, the, the, the response they will give you ordinarily is to say, you know, uh, this is beyond your jurisdiction and as such, you know, you are not entitled to get uh, those kind of information. So the OECD has pushed framework that will naturally and automatically improve transparency you know, uh, within uh, the, the global system. And those are the kind of framework that Nigeria has, you know, also adopted in recent times. Like I used to tell my people, you know, this is a new era of taxation. Transparency is the order of the day. You know, we have the uh, country by country reporting. We have the common, common reporting standard, you know, where all your assets have been disclosed to the tax authority for, for the purpose of, uh, you know, a risk assessment so that they can determine whether you have been paying the right share of, uh, of taxes. So like I want to say, there are good side of international taxation that if you actually embrace them, you know, you can increase your share of the pie of the pizza. But the bad side is where you have to expertly, you know, dimension and say, this is where I'm going as a nation. And if I implement this aspect of this recommendation coming from the global scene, then uh, I may not be able to get to where I'm going as a nation. And we saw that very recently. You know, there is a two-pillar proposal coming from the, the OECD on the OECD. digital economy and the minimum tax uh, regime. You know, that, and Nigeria, you know, currently is on the side that we may not go for that because we have something that think we push us in the direction that we want to go better than what you are recommending from there. But there are some other aspects that Nigeria has embraced. The country by country reporting standard, the common reporting standard have been uh, embraced by Nigeria. You know, the rev revision to the OECD model tax convention and the prov provisions that were revised also has also been embraced in Nigeria. Brilliant. So that is the perspective brilliant, to look at it. brilliant and very wonderful presentation. 
given the perspective of what uh, OECD has actually been doing as the uh, center of focus in the areas of substance uh, coherence and making taxation to be transparent. Uh, I know if the big boys have to use their digital uh, way of doing things, uh, we of the developing nation might find ourselves one thing. But I think with the coercion uh, aspect and the transparency that has been brought to bear, uh, nations like us uh, can definitely benefit from what you're saying on the area of country by country reporting and the other aspect of it. Uh, just to make it interactive, I can see Kola Wale a law uh bringing this question uh up saying is there any international uh taxation professional body uh in nigeria uh uh okay welcome back mr imado uh the question from Allah is asking if there is any international taxation professional body in nigeria just like we have uh the citn the icon and other things uh do you have a response to this Sorry, can you can you come again with that question? I had a bit okay, of a yeah, so. okay. Uh Kola Wale Law is asking if there is any international traditional professional body in Nigeria. Oh, I, I I think I mentioned that earlier. You know, maybe he just joined us. Uh, let me just okay. speak to that again. So we have a body called the International No Fiscal Association (IFA). You know, they pride themselves as the body of international tax experts in Nigeria. So if you are interested in being part of them, I think uh, the, the association is open to uh, public membership and uh, you can apply to do that. But like I said, you know, there is no requirement to be part of any body before you can you can practice international taxation. Yeah, I, I think Omola Ratu is uh, asking this uh, question. Uh, is saying, uh, what is the role of FRS in investigating the competitiveness of transfer pricing? Does the FRS have the capability to do a good job? Okay, thank you, Omolara. You want to set me up? You know, I interact <laughs> with FRS a lot, but uh, I will be I will be candid enough uh, in my response and uh, put the correct perspective to it. You know, the transfer pricing regime in Nigeria started uh, in 2013. You know, the re the regulation was published in 2nd of August of 2012, the very first regulation, and you know, it was a new thing in Nigeria. Everybody was pretty learning, even including the consultant and the tax authority. We were just learning the subject. You know, uh, in in 2013, 2013 being the first year of compliance. But uh, give it to the tax authority. You know, they've done a good job of uh, partnering with the OECD. You know, we had session where the OECD personnel came into Nigeria to train our tax authority on how to review transfer prices and also perform transfer pricing audit exercises. You know, and uh, over time, you know, uh, we've also seen, you know, representative from the FRS being part of the conversation going on at the OECD level as, as per coming up, you know, with new laws and new framework as the case may be from time to time. So over the years, you know, uh, we can say that the transfer pricing in regime in Nigeria is maturing. In 2018, you know, uh, they revised the TP regulation to even address some gaps that were uh, in existence in the very first uh, edition of the, of, the, of the regulation, you know. So, uh, over time, they've kind of ramp up knowledge and uh, these days what we are seeing so far is that the FRS has a step up, you know, in the, in the aspect of uh, investigating the competitiveness of the uh, transfer pricing. And uh, these days, you know, they've been raking in some good money from transfer pricing adjustment. So if from that alone, I, I think uh, they, they must have developed capacity to do a good job in reviewing those prices. Brilliantly, and I can support you on that. There was a time I always hear of uh, a, a name in FRS, uh, Mr. Gojubola, who is an expert Matthew. in uh, yeah. Matthew Gojubola, who is also yeah. a member. And like you said, uh, they seems to be raking good money even for the mm -hmm. government from the international tax. Uh, um, uh, Suleiman is uh, uh, saying something. How can a company determine the CUP where the company enjoys a monopoly of its products in Nigeria. Uh, are you okay. with me? That, 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 that's a technical, 
yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's a technical question. I'd rather say you should come to me so that I provide a private advice on that. But it's fine. <laughs> Let me attempt to, to respond to that, you know, in the sense that uh, the CUP, as he has rightly mentioned, is what we call the uh, comparable uncontrolled prices. So in transfer pricing, what we try to do as much as possible is to con compare controlled transaction with uncontrolled transactions. So what is trying to ask, you know, if I can help the audience to understand the question, is to say where you enjoy monopoly in the market and you can't readily find, you know, uh, or, uh, independent people, you know, uh, rendering those kind of service or selling those kind of products in the market, then are you able to apply, you know, the, the CUP reliably, you know? So there is a different aspect to CUP. There's something called the internal CUP, you know, where you have information internally, both information of third parties and information of related party. But when it comes to external application of CUP, that's where you have to rely on databases. You know, uh, databases are, um, are independent uh, people coming together to collect data about transactions that you can possibly use for the purpose of your transfer pricing analysis. So you may not get the, the data from your economy, and that's where your technical competence will then come in for you to perform the relevant uh, CP adjustment to those data so that uh, what you are now what you have as your final set of comparable is indeed comparable with what you try to test. You no, know, there's a balance in transfer pricing. Please, you must not compare Apple with Mango. Please make sure that you are comparing Apple with Apple. You know, and as much as possible, whatever you are doing, you want to be sure that at the end of the day, you are comparing Apple with Apple. Comparing Apple with Apple, comparing orange with orange, and don't compare mango with a uh, banana so that it will not slip you <laughs> off the road. Uh, what a wonderful delivery. And I'm sure uh, our audience have actually benefited uh, from that. Uh, before we go on a very short break, let me quickly bring this uh, to you. Uh, but Mr. Onosami, uh, what is the relationship between transfer pricing and double taxation? Is there any correlation between them? Oh, okay. Okay. I, I, I would not say correlation because uh, if transfer pricing is actually done the right way, it's actually the cure to double taxation. Brilliant. You understand? Brilliant. So, so if you have done your transfer pricing the right way, that is the cure to double taxation. I will paint a scenario to explain that. And uh, if you, you, for example, I'm an entity in Nigeria and I'm enjoying management support from an entity in, say, Ghana, you understand? Uh, you know, and I'm not careful enough to ensure that, you know, the prices of those management supports reflect what we call an arm's length price, you know, the price that an independent party would have agreed to pay, assuming they are not related, you know, uh, at all, you understand. So if you fail to ensure that those prices reflect an arm's length, you are faced with the risk of double taxation. And why? Because the moment I pay that money to the Ghana entity, the tax authority in Ghana has already, you know, taxed that amount. So God now help me if the Nigerian tax authority comes for a transfer pricing audit and revise the amount that I supposed to have paid, you understand, and then raise additional assessment based on that audit exercise. I will pay <laughs> additional tax in Nigeria that may not get corresponding adjustment in Ghana. You understand? Although they are trying to put in place bilateral instrument for corresponding uh, adjustment, but it's not as seamless as that. It takes process. It takes years before you are even able to get corresponding adjustment. In some cases, it's impossible. You understand? So if you are not careful enough, you know, as a, uh, as a business to ensure your, that your transfer pricing interaction is strongly reflects you know, uh, an arm's length outcome. When I say strongly effect an arm's length outcome, it's such a manner that you can defend it with supporting a, a, a evidence and economic facts. You know, you may be facing the risk of double taxation when the taxman comes knocking. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Let me quickly attend to Oluwag Bemiga. He's trying to seek uh, some clarification. Uh, he said, how can individual, not firm, not complain, 
uh, be involved in international taxation. Uh, he's painting a scenario that uh, do you have a platform where uh, one can do consultancy service for international company, company of individual? The question looks a bit uh, tricky, but, but I'm sure you can provide uh, uh, you know, response to that. Is okay, if, if, if I just let, 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 so if you want to be involved in providing service to individuals in the international uh, yeah, taxation space, space I think yeah. uh, the first thing for you, the first thing for you to appreciate is how does the international taxation space affect individuals? You understand? Okay. And uh, the, le, 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 let me help you by saying that, uh, you know, the tax regime in different countries, they differ. For example, if you are a Nigerian and you are, uh, you are if you are a Nigerian, you know, you are, you, and you are based in Nigeria, you have tax obligation to pay tax on your global income. Whether you earn the income, you understand, from, from anywhere, your global income is taxable in Nigeria. And we can see the incidence of Nigerians nowadays having double citizenship. You know, you have a Canadian citizenship, you have UK citizenship, US citizenship in addition with your Nigerian citizenship. So from an individual perspective, the fact that you are a citizen of a nation ordinarily confers some tax obligation on you. You understand? I'm aware that in the case of US, wherever you are located, notwithstanding to the extent, that you are still carrying the U.S. passport, you have some filing obligation to do in the U.S., you understand? So you may not have tax to pay, but you have filing to be done. And tax returns has to be filed, you understand? And we've seen also, you know, uh, the issues around um, people going to Canada, having dual citizenship in Canada, there's also tax obligation in Canada. So from an independent person or individual perspective, and if you want to provide consulting service in that space, you have to first understand, you know, how your, your multiple citizenship can expose you to different taxes in different jurisdictions. And in addition to that, you know, when you are also doing transactions that are cross-border, for example, I'm in Nigeria, I plug into Fivers, I plug into, uh, I plug into Udeme, I plug in into Upworks, and I'm churning work from my room in Nigeria for for an international company somewhere in Netherlands, and they are paying me in USD in my account. So what are the type of taxes that I'm exposed to? Am I exposed? Am I expected to pay taxes in Nigeria? Am I also expected to pay taxes uh, in, in the Netherlands? So you need to first appreciate all those aspects of taxation. And that is where you can say, you know, you want to start providing some form of support to individuals when it comes to uh, international tax. Brilliant, brilliant. We must have a deeper knowledge of uh, what taxation is all about before we delve into it as an individual to carry that out. Uh, I've been uh, on with uh, Mr. Emmanuel Nosami SCA, uh, who is a senior manager with Adamson Tax, talking international taxation and Nigeria economy. In a short while, we'll be going on a very short break and we will be right back. Stay connected with us on ICANN on air. Thank you. finance professional in a disrupted business landscape what does it take to be in demand what does it take to attract great paying international roles if you're an ICANN member it'll just take one exam that's all it takes to complete the globally recognized SEMA professional qualification and the internationally in respected CGMA designation as a SEMA member and a CGMA designation holder, employers will look at you as a finance professional, constantly acquiring new skills to add value to the business. That's why they'll be willing to pay premium to hire and retain you. If you have five years of relevant experience and are an ICANN member, you can directly sit for the final exam of the SEMA professional qualification, the strategic case study exam. 
Start studying the SEMA professional qualification. Prepare to make an impact. Welcome back, our professional colleagues, friends, students, ladies and gentlemen. You are on ICANN on air uh, for this day, Tuesday, the 21st of June. And I've been discussing international taxation and Nigeria economy with Mr. Emmanuel Ososabi, a member of our great institute. Uh, you welcome back, Mr. Onosame. Uh, Let's go straight Thank you very to, much, Mr. Chesson. Uh, yeah, a few questions before we bring it to uh, a close for today. You see, it is impossible uh, for us not to touch on digitalization when we talk on ICANN on air, because one of the uh, <laughs> back that we have given uh, to you is digitalization has brought this to bear. Can you tell us how digitalization has shaped taxation and your estimation in Nigeria? Is it faring well that uh, in the aspect of tax digitalization? Okay, let me backtrack a bit uh, in responding to that. You know, I mentioned the base erosion and profit shifting project. And luckily, the very first action, you know, what that project is all about is that they looked at the different mechanisms that multinationals, taxpayers used to either avoid taxes or evade taxes and the, the bucket all the action points into 15 of them. The very first action is addressing the challenge relating to digital economy. You know, <laughs> when we drafted our local tax law, nobody was thinking digital economy, nobody was thinking the internet, you understand? So although yeah. some of those laws are out, to are out of date and they are, <laughs> they, they are unable to catch up with the development that is going on globally. You know, we are here this evening. Some people may be plugged in from Netherlands. Some people may be plugged in for, from any platform, you know, and somebody is providing that service. You understand? And uh, where, where is the service being provided? Where is the service being enjoyed? Those questions are on the table. Where should the taxes be paid? You yeah. understand? For, for the value that is being uh, derived. So those are the concerns that we address in that very first action point. And you know, those are the things leading to the two pillar, you know, solution that I also spoke about earlier. You know, for you to understand the 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 the, the, the impact of the digital economy, you can actually be in Nigeria and earn, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you dollars, know, in Nigeria, yeah. having not leave the shore of Nigeria. And you know, the traditional definition of fixed base, you know, for you to be taxable in any country is where you have a physical location or you have a dependent <laughs> agent. You are you understand those things yeah. are being shattered by technology. You understand? And what's the conversation going on in the digital uh, in, in, in the international space is to then say, no, we can no longer watch. You know, I can mention some name because they are household name and they won't constitute any form of uh, you know, risk in the, on this platform, you know, every one of us, we enjoy Netflix. You understand? Netflix it doesn't have any shop in Nigeria or no, any form of presence in Nigeria, you know, but we pay we pay them some good money and they are generating value from Nigeria. You know, we we put out adverts on Facebook to, to promote our, our, our goods and market and, and products, you know, and Facebook is actually getting income from Nigeria. Instagram, the same, you know, we have Amazon selling to Nigeria from wherever, you understand. We have Walmart doing the same thing, selling, you understand. Those kind of uh, digital economy, they've come, they've made us to realize that we will be losing a lot of money if we don't pay attention to the taxation of the digital economy. You understand? And, yeah. uh, you know, at the international scene, there's a framework that is called uh, that is called the two pillar solution that you're trying to put in place to kind of uh, address the digital economy. And the, uh, the first pillar of the two pillar is uh, speaking about uh, you know taxation of the digital economy, where some some businesses that meet some particular threshold of revenue in a particular country will be deemed to have crystallized a, a fee base there. You understand? So, for example, if, for example, say Twitter generated advert income up to so-so-so amount of dollars, you understand, in a particular year, 
it will crystallize a fees base in Nigeria such that Twitter will then have to pay tax in Nigeria based on the income that is generated from Nigeria. You know, and those framework are being developed and uh, it's expected that by the end of 2020, uh, end of this year, you know, it's going to be finalized and then it's going to be rolled out, you know, in 2023. Nigeria has not fully indicated interest to be part of this for some reservation, but Nigeria also has its own variant of uh, is as its own way of addressing the, the digital economy. So Nigeria has also fashioned out what we call a, 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 an order, you know, called the significant economic presence order, you know, in Nigeria. I don't know if we are all familiar with that order oh, in this room. It, it, yeah, the significant economic presence order. So what Nigeria has said that if you as a foreign business or an international business or a digital business that meets the criteria set out in that order, and up to 25 million naira in Nigeria for any, in any year, that income has crystallized a tax, if it's a fees base for you in Nigeria. You understand? Such that yeah. you will then have to account for all the income that you generated in Nigeria and prepare your results for the Nigerian operation and then pay the taxes that you are supposed to pay in Nigeria. You understand? So Nigeria believes that uh, the significant economic order can allow us to get more income and capture more digital businesses than the framework that the OECD has suggested. And as such, they are not too ready to plug into what the OECD is suggesting on digital economy. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, and that will take me to this question. I know you give kudos to FRS that they are actually trying their bit in keeping tab on the international uh, taxation. But I, I just want you to, in your personal view, uh, since you you do, you carry out businesses with uh, this uh, arm of uh, the agency of government, what area do you think they can improve uh, to keep tab on international taxation? Well, a lot is going on on the international scene. A lot, a lot, I, a lot different uh, framework coming up every day, different instrument coming up every day, you know, and uh, what I just want to put on the table, yes, Nigeria has been part of the conversation, has been in the room when the conversation is going on. I want to believe that the interest of Nigeria has always been maintained, you understand, and, uh, in this in this conversation. So my, my concern is only the aspect of implementation. You know, uh, there's a reason you plug in into this framework is so that number one, you can increase your tax base, you understand, and uh, raking more taxpayer into the tax net. For example, you know, the Common Reporting Standard uh, Regulation is an initiative of the OECD that- Well, we, we still Sign have uh, Mr. Onosami, but I think there's a slight uh, internet uh, uh, destruction. Hello, can you, can you hear me now? Okay, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. We understand uh, the interruption from uh, the internet. Go ahead, please. Oh, okay. So I was trying to uh, give an example, you know, of such a thing that I think we can be better with the implementation. So I was citing the example of the common reporting standard. The, the way the common reporting standard works is to say, uh, you know, you obtain information from financial institution that houses the assets of companies and individual and report those information to the tax authority such that they share the information with each other. So Nigeria will obtain the information from the financial institution in Nigeria concerning some other uh, people that are in Nigeria that have obligation outside Nigeria and then report it to the respective countries that have interest in such information and vice versa. Nigeria also will receive information about Nigerians that ought to be paying taxes in Nigeria from other jurisdictions. But what we have seen so far, you know, is uh, the compliance aspect of it, you know, the tax authority pushing for banks to, uh, to plug in into that initiative and uh, file the returns as expected. But what we have not seen in recent time is what the tax authority is doing in analyzing those data that they are receiving year on year on that framework. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's an idea of just getting a data dump and you can't make any, <laughs> any sense out of that data. Any sense of but who is, uh, who is analyzing the information that you are receiving and bringing out insight from those information such that you can expand the tax net and bring more people to the tax net, increase your tax base, and, uh, and uh, as a result, also increase uh, your tax revenue as, as a nation. So that is one aspect of it. It's not just brilliant enough for you to see the positive 
in the, the recommendation coming from the international scene and uh, be, be, be happy to plug into it, you have to be careful enough to also ensure that you are able to extract the benefits that are coming from those framework. Otherwise, you know, you, are, you must have shortchanged yourself as a nation. Very brilliant, very brilliant. Not just dumping the data, not just gathering it. All you need to do is make sure you analyze and get the good out of it that will be beneficiary to us. Uh, while we are rounding up, while we are rounding up, please, can you advise the Nigerian tax practitioner on the emerging taxation issue? Your advice, just in one word. Okay, you know, you know. Let, let me just put it out there that the traditional tax base is saturated. You know, and if you want to actually differentiate yourself, you know, uh, in the market and command premium in the market, this is an aspect, a niche aspect that you can specialize. You know, there's a lot of things going on, common reporting standard, country by country reporting standard, you know, uh, automatic exchange of information, uh, 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 OECD model tax convention, you know, and all those two pillar, you know, recommendation going on you know there's a there's a service that we are coming up in in Andesi, if you permit me to mention it is to say we call it the beps advisory you know where we proactive proactively you know review uh, the books of multinational and advise them on how the development in the international space will potentially affect their businesses in the coming year you know so that they can plan towards that so i will just put it out there that there are a lot of niche area coming up and there are other opportunities opening up for tax practitioners in Nigeria. If you can plug in, then you definitely be smiling to the back. Brilliantly, brilliantly, brilliantly. Let's get involved, uh, do more research, and uh, increase our knowledge base in international taxation. I will be benef beneficiary of the goodies and the largest that uh, is uh, entrenched in it. On the final note, can we have your parting words in less than 30 seconds? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ushesson, for having me this evening. Thank you, the team, and uh, I can for giving me the uh, opportunity. I sincerely appreciate that. So for the audience, thank you for also joining. You've made the session uh, interesting. Uh, I want to believe that uh, we've passed across some insightful uh, comments this evening, and uh, it's just for us to continue to monitor the space. There's a lot happening in that space. Monitor that space, and that will make you a better tax practitioner. Because the truth is, you could offer domestic advice, and a development in the international scene will throw your advice wrong. You understand? If you are not following what is going on from the international scene, you may not be able to provide an holistic advice to your clients every time. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Onosave for this wonderful and insightful section on I Can On Air. And let me also appreciate all our audience for being part of us uh, today. Before I go, let me quickly chip in a small announcement to tell us that the 52nd Annual Accountant Conference of our great institute will be coming up in October. And we want each and every one of us to prepare and be part of this. And uh, without wasting our time on this note, we have come to the end of the show, and I want to bring to your notice that we will be gathering again on Thursday, the 23rd of June, 2022, same time, 6 p.m., on all our social media handle, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Stay connected and come and have educative section, insightful section that can enrich you and make you more productive. See you same time on Thursday, the 23rd of June, 2022. Bye for now from our production team.